All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about ME, Metabolism, and I, the, uh, the title of my talk. It's going to be largely going on about metabolomics and the studies that we have done for in MECFS. So I'll briefly go over metabolomics. I'm glad Bob touched on it a little bit there. But essentially, metabolites are small organic molecules that exist within many different parts of your body, many different biofluids. They're really uh, engaging with the external environment because they're altered by the external environment. They initiate genes. They will then initiate those genes to create proteins, which will then alter the metabolites themselves. And so they're kind of sitting there within a, like a large dynamic of different things within the cellular process. And that is why they give us so much information about what's going on in the cells themselves. So on the right there, we've got a few graphs uh, looking at metabolomics and probably more well-known fields, proteomics and genomics. In response to a, a, a stress or an external stress of any kind, uh, you'll get rapid changes in the metabolomics information. At the same time period, you'll get a slow change in the proteomics and genomics, you'll get virtually very minimal changes. So when I say a, a stressor, it, it can be something like eating, waking up, exercise, metabolomics will give you information about all those different things and it constantly changing. So this is somewhat of the reason why we're looking at metabolomics for MECFS and this is why we started researching it about six or seven years ago. Uh, it's because we wanted to see how sensitive uh, this, the information in MECFS patients are, given how fluctuating some of their symptoms are, and we wanted to see whether we could rely, reliably find metabolites that re are related quite strongly to the symptoms within people with MECFS. But also at the same time, look at the underlying pattern. So today I'm actually going to just quickly cover over the uh, large study that we did. We actually were done a metabolomic study in 2012 as a very preliminary study. Uh, and then from there we went on to do this much larger study, which we separated into two separate papers and I've never really uh, culminated that research into, into one package before. So I thought I'd do that today and then slowly describe what we think that means. So what we looked at was only a female cohort. We get such large differences between males and females when it comes to metabolite changes. We looked at 35 patients versus 24 we call non-MECF patients. We say non-MECFS because healthy is such a hard thing to define, but we just wanted people who weren't, or weren't diagnosed of, of MECFS and relatively healthy. So we looked at the urine, blood, and fecal samples. We took symptom questionnaires from the patients at the time, and that was all collected within a 24-hour period. From the fecal samples, we also found, we looked at the microbes, fresh quantitation of the microbes that were inhabiting the colon at the time. And then we did metabolomics analysis on the urine, blood, and fecal samples. And altogether, we put this in a, in a, a glorious large data matrix, which we could really assess that information as a whole, but also individual parts. So I wanted to start with this as the physiological disorder slide because after I've given talks in the past, people have asked me whether, you know, is this information of a physiological disorder? And I'm like, well, yes, definitely. Uh, and this is, this is probably the graphs that indicate to me the best that it's a physiological, or the most simply that it's a physiological disorder. So I'm not going to explain how the graphs work, but essentially uh, algorithms, it's a, it's a program that the computer will use algorithms to divide data uh, based on patterns that it observes within the data and just separate out different samples within it. We don't actually tell the algorithm whether the, these things, these, uh, the data points are from people with CFS or controls. Uh, it just thinks it's just random people that it's separating out. After the fact, we label uh, which ones are controls in CFS, and you can see that the computer already does a little bit of a good job of separating that out. Uh, even in the top graphs, we can see 
that's just information straight out of the machine. We can just put blood, urine, uh, fecal samples straight into the NMR, take the spectrum out, chop it up into little pieces, and then put it into this algorithm, and it can tell you there is a defined difference. Now, if you're looking at something like diabetes, where you have a strong biomarker, and glucose is a metabolite, oh, oops, sorry, um, you would get quite a strong change, probably like a grouping out here, quite significant from controls because glucose is such an important thing. So what it really says is there's no real uh, biomarker that we can see from our sample set. However, you can see the broad change over the metabolism that there is a definable difference. So these were the uh, changes in metabolites that we saw from blood, urine and faecal samples. Uh, I'm not going to go over each one individually other than to suggest I'll show you the amounts that we found. So of the 29 metabolites we looked at, seven were significantly uh, statistically altered within the blood. Eight of the 30 metabolites in the urine were statistically altered, and four of the 24 metabolites in the fecal samples were significantly altered. So what do we think is occurring in these patients? So given this information that we got from the metabolite data, we wanted to come with a broad mechanism that could describe what was occurring. We also, as I said, had the microbe data and we actually found a change, significant change in the bacteria. Uh, we found an increase in certain bacteria that are a bit more scavenging uh, in nature, uh, the Clostridia. And we, and we also have in the past, working with people, seen a lot of bacterial overgrowths. So I'm going to really try and make this as simple as possible, describing what we see. So in, in a, I guess, a healthy individual, you know, you would eat some food. It would have complex carbohydrates, sugars, fat, protein. Uh, that sugar would really be absorbed from the small intestines into the blood into the cell. The complex carbohydrates would make their way into the colon to be digested into short-chain fatty acids, which are important for intestinal health. And the fat and protein would be digested to fatty acids and amino acids in the small intestines that would also be absorbed into the, into the cell itself. Those fatty acids and amino acids are important for creating other cellular proteins and cell fats within the cell. It's also important for making enzymes and bile acids, which then feed back into the small intestines to digest, uh, digest uh, other fats and proteins. So there's like a nice little cycle here. Fatty acids can also be somewhat used by the mitochondria um, as for energy production. And you also get glucose coming in, which can use mitochondria for energy production, or it, it doesn't have to use any, uh, mitochondria for energy production. And these are kind of just relative values of how much energy per molecule you would get, so a molecule of sugar, from uh, relative amounts from these different um, pathways for energy production. So you can see per molecule, not using oxygen is, is quite taxing, it's quite inefficient, but given that this pathway is much faster in nature over, over, the, over the time course, you actually get a lot more energy from it, which is an important thing to define, I think. We have AMPK as a major protein uh, metabolic switch within cells. And I just wanted to highlight what happens in a low energy system. You get low nutrients and energy. It, uh, the AMPK detects that, it turns on, and you suddenly get a switch. So you can see from prior to the switch, you know, you've, you've got um, all kind of systems running. But once the switch is on, really AMPK really prioritizes the use of mitochondria for efficient molecules because it's sensing that there's low energy. It, it wants to make energy at the most efficient way per molecule it can. And so in doing that, you can actually take away fats and amino acids that would usually be going for cell proteins and cell fats to make energy, and glucose would generally go and bypass this to make uh, energy as well. Uh, so it would always use, sorry, oxygen to make energy as well. So what we think is maybe a low, long-term low energy adaptation is that over time, because you get less of those cell proteins and cell fats being created, you get less of these enzymes and amino acids, uh, enzymes and bile acids being created, which provides less digestion within your small intestines. So in doing that, you get less free fatty acids and amino acids feeding back into the blood, 
But I guess the important thing here from what we're assuming from the fecal, uh, back of the fecal data that we had and the bacteria data is that that uh, protein and fat isn't getting digested with when it should be. It stays in the in, uh, intestines a lot longer and provides substrates for more bacteria to grow here. So I probably should have said these little orange dots are bacteria at the top. These red ones are obviously new bacteria, changes to bacteria, and a growth of bacteria. Uh, these bacteria have the ability to digest. They're now growing on that, and this may be the reason why you get an overgrowth and a change in these bacteria. They also, they can digest these fats into smaller amino acids and fatty acids, and then they also digest this in anaerobic metabolism in the colon into more short-chain fatty acids. So yes, you like short-chain fatty acids for intestinal health, but once you get too many of them, they will overflow into the blood, and they do have the ability, obviously, to be used by, well, not obvious, but I didn't put the arrow, but they have the ability to be used by mitochondria for energy, but they also can turn on AMPK as well. So it's interesting because it feed, creates kind of a feedback and where a positive feedback, which is all, always that common where AMPK can take energy away, from, well, can take protein away from enzymes. The bacteria like that because they get more substrate and they kind of create that sort of environment to keep that going. Uh, we wanted to know really what are cellular proteins being used for this, and this is something that we can't see from this, um, to, to kind of keep up the amount of fatty acids and amino acids being used, and that's something we would definitely like to study in the future. Key benefits of metabolomics are therefore really to give us insight into the possible mechanisms of the disorder. It's also useful to give us explanations of symptoms and components of the disorder, and metabolomic studies may give us insight into the cause one day. So I covered ME and metabolism. The I is actually for the individual, and this really brings us to the future studies. As I mentioned at the start, there was the metabolomics fluctuations were quite rapid. Well, if you're looking at a lot of points in different individuals, you could get someone who is here versus someone who is here and assume that they're at the same point. Combining that with all the genetic and other factors that can alter in individuals, uh, it seems more pertinent to research the individual over time and looking at how they change from their worst to their best days and the days in between and seeing whether you can trace changes in the metabolism that explain those improvements. Or I'd like to acknowledge the, the funders of our research, large funders, Mason Foundation, um, and solve MECFS initiative. And thanks for uh, Open Medicine Foundation for inviting me, Bioscreen for looking into the, the bacteria, CFS Discovery, which is the clinic my um, clinician has and gives us the samples, which is obviously extremely valuable, works with the patient, Don Lewis. And Metabol uh, Melbourne Bioanalytics is a new site that we're opening up to kind of give information to people uh, as Ron was saying, trying to disseminate information prior to publication and keep the community involved in the research. Thank you very much.